NASA has also had some losses mm -hmm. uh, through the time. And of course, you talked about preparation, training, uh, persistence, accountability, all those things in Apollo 13. But bearing in mind that we've heard a lot about guidelines and recommendations, etc., cetera, uh, all this morning or, uh, and during the, the midday, um, could you then tell us how you at NASA took learnings from those? Uh, right. Well, when I came into NASA, it was 1990, so they had just gotten back to return to flight after the Challenger accident, and I was somewhat familiar with it, but once I got on board there and really, I mean, had the detailed debriefings and so forth, and it was a marked change in NASA culture after that happened. You know, it was, it was quite egregious, actually, on the human factor side or the, the organizational side of not listening to the inputs. There were plenty of technical inputs that could have prevented that tragedy, and, and that's what made it even more tragic. Uh, the whole time I was in the astronaut corps, I found a, a, you know, a very strong culture in terms of, you know, the, the stop work approach, anyone can have inputs, uh, and, and everyone obviously very, very sensitive to it, and, and in recognizing that, um, you know, we're in a 99.999% business. Um, again, it, but it, uh, I left NASA in 99, and then just a few years later, I get up on a Saturday morning, specifically early, it was in California, 6 a.m., specifically to watch Rick Husband land Columbia. He was a good friend of mine. He had worked for me in the astronaut corps, and then, of course, turned into one of the worst days of my life, to see it happen yet again on Columbia with, uh, I knew, six of the seven astronauts on board. Uh, and then to see afterwards, of course, I was not part of NASA at the time, so not privy to a lot of the early kind of words coming out, but my assessment afterwards was it was much less egregious than Challenger in terms of the human shortfalls. However, it was enough, and the net result was the same. And there were some uh, shortfalls in, you know, misinterpreting some of the data, you know, the garbage in, garbage out, the inputs they received, uh, mischaracterizing at a systemic level what everyone just thought was a maintenance issue that really was a huge safety issue. And even, you know, I mean, I must admit myself when they said some foam came off the ET only about 13 meters ahead of where it struck the orbit, I go... How much harm could that do? Yeah. But what was kind of missing from everyone's mind, you know, from first analysis was it had so much deceleration at that speed, it, it, its relative velocity compared to the shuttle itself went from zero to 500 miles an hour, so what's it, maybe 1,000 kilometers an hour, 900 kilometers an hour, give or take, uh, like that. And that amount of kinetic energy, there was no, absolutely no chance that the uh, carbon, carbon, reinforced carbon, carbon was going to withstand it. So, again, a very hard lesson learned, and uh, but very well documented, so that you yeah, could and, and learn again, from since it. then they've they've again, you know, gone to another level of conservatism in the way that the operations are done, and they actually have, you know, they do a, an inspection on orbit using the arm, and they have a safe haven on station if they needed to. They always have a for every flight since return to flight after Columbia, they've had a shuttle rescue mission kind of keyed up on the pad, ready to go. And there's also the recognition that, you know, the shuttle, the hardware's old. Uh, it's legacy systems that we've been trying to operate sa safely, and uh, it is time to retire it. Now we just have two flights left. Okay. I only have two more questions. Okay. <laughs> Good. Now, this may be uh, just a little bit naive question, so you, you go ahead and answer it quickly. Okay. Uh, now, there's the... Um, ESA, NASA, and mm -hmm. Roscosmos, and whatever kind of organizations that we have. If, for example, a satellite blows up, let's say, over Kazakhstan or somewhere, yeah. do you actually uh, speak together and, and share this information about what went, went wrong? Yes, there's actually, uh, amongst the civil space programs around the world, there's a lot of information traded. Not so much amongst the military, uh, like in the United States, it's the Air Force's purview and the National Reconnaissance uh, Office. Uh, but definitely on the civil side, and there's, you know, the, the Chinese intentionally blew up a satellite as a military test here a few years ago, and it, it, it aggravated the entire rest of the world space community, and probably actually aggravated a lot of people in China, too, because really, they're not helping themselves by putting all that debris and space junk out there. But, yeah, there's a lot of lessons learned that are trading conferences similar to this. Um, my focus was a little bit on the, the human space flight on the pad kind of stuff because I could draw more similarities there with, with your industry. But in the uh, on-orbit stuff for both the manned and unmanned systems, there's a lot of interchange that goes on. Okay. 
Now, we spoke a little bit yesterday, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that you're aware of that. I have spoken to a lot of scientists, and one of uh, part of my admiration for these people is that they are part of a huge system, mm -hmm. uh, but they only contribute with a little, little bit. And sometimes they get to be heroes, and sometimes they're just right. a little part yeah. of it. And what you said today was that it might be the reality of tomorrow and, and so on, and working with something that's part of a bigger picture. Now, before you leave us, uh, I would just like to say that, of course, the goal is for you, and talking about safety, that everybody gets home safe. Mm -hmm. But what do you think is the larger goal, being an astronaut? Oh, of, of human space exploration? Mm -hmm. I, of course, I, and I grew up reading science fiction, and I've, just, I've always been a space junkie from day one. And for me, it's always been about expanding human presence uh, out into the solar system, and eventually, I mean, hundreds of years from now, well beyond any of our lifetimes uh, out into the universe. I just, I just feel that that's important. I've always had as much an emotional tie as an intellectual tie to that. And of course, I've worked with many like-minded people in the, in the space program. And that's, you know, it's great to be part of uh, a collection of people that have that kind of long-range vision. And sometimes it's kind of wild and we wonder if we'll ever get there, but uh, it's kind of the vision. Yeah. That's a wonderful vision. Yeah, thank thanks. you very much, Rich, yeah. for joining thank us you, today. It's a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Have a safe thank trip you. home. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.